Hi, this is the overview video for Chapter 11, Introduction to Magnetism. Chapter 11 is a long chapter that covers all topics relating to magnetism. It covers the background about the magnet and magnetic fields and what they mean in a couple different ways. Magnetic force exerted by magnetic field and which is probably new to almost everyone in this class, what's called induced voltage or electromagnetic induction. Let me take a few minutes to quickly outline what each of the sections cover. Section 11.1 .1 covers the background material. This is what I'm hoping a lot of you will find familiar um, about the bar magnet, horseshoe magnet, things that you might have seen in your previous science classes, including compass and how that relates to the Earth's magnetic poles. And finally, how when you take a magnet and break into pieces, then each of those pieces become little magnetic dipoles with both north and south poles. So this is what I'm hoping many of you will find familiar. But in case this is your first time seeing it, it's all summarized in this section so that we all have the same starting point. The electromagnets covered in section 11.2 is what might be new to many of you, that you can get magnetic effect. So the first part of section 11.2 describes ferromagnets. These are the permanent magnets that you might be used to seeing before. They are made out of permanent magnetization of the material. There's the description in there. Please take a look at it. It's the electromagnet that you might not remember seeing in everyday life. And the gist of the section is that you can observe the same thing you observe in a permanent magnet. You might remember seeing a picture like this in your earlier science class. You can get this by sprinkling iron filings over a permanent magnet. These connected lines of iron filings visualize the magnetic field lines. And you can get a very similar picture with a loop of current. So these are showing top half of the loops, but imagine the bottom half that's underneath the paper and there's a current that's flowing through this loop and those electrical current which you might remember covering in chapter 10 produces magnetic fields with the same effect on the iron filings as the permanent magnet did. So in chapter 10 I said that we will be leaning heavily on the concept of field so in chapter 11 we start out just talking about magnetic field and I'm hoping these images will help you start thinking of magnetic field as a familiar concept that it exists and, and it has a real effect on physical objects. And the point of the next section, 11.3, is to give you that intuitive feel for magnetic field. So you imagine placing tiny little compasses around the, say, permanent magnet and the direction of the compass will basically indicate the direction of the field. And we'll come back to this in section 11.7, Ampere's Law. Uh, but these are the, um, but so that you have some inkling of it now, these are the directions of magnetic fields produced by electric current. So if you have a loop of electric current, imagine looking down from top, going counterclockwise, that electric current will produce magnetic fields that go in these directions shown. Now, if you have a straight current, current in a straight piece of wire as shown here, those will produce magnetic fields that go in circles around the current. And we will introduce something called the right hand rule. And there will be separate sets of videos on describing the right hand rules. But I guess what I'm trying to get at is electric current produce magnetic field. And it'll take some work to learn uh, what their directions are. So up until this point, we tried to make the idea of magnetic field seem as familiar as possible. And um, to a great degree, 
it's familiar. It, you, if you have seen compass before, then you already have some sense of what magnetic fields do. Now, <laughs> at the very fundamental level, uh, magnetism is very strange. That's what section 11.4 is getting at force on a moving charge in a magnetic field. So you got a hint of this with the electromagnets that somehow you can make a magnet using electric current. So there is some kind of connection between electricity and magnetism. And what you are going to see in this section, 11.4, is that magnetic field will cause a force on an electric charge. Not magnetic charge, which doesn't exist, but on an electric charge. Now, there are some conditions that have to be met. The electric charge has to be moving for there to be a magnetic force on the electric charge. And I think it's uh, easier to give uh, more concrete examples in the next section, but let me just uh, point this out here. This uh, diagram is illustrating the right-hand rule and it's kind of showing you the direction of magnetic field, direction of the velocity of the moving charge, and the force on the moving charge. So let's say magnetic field is going up along the direction of the finger. And you somehow have things arranged so that the electric charge, say the positive charge, is moving in the direction of V velocity. So that would be in the direction of the thumb then the magnetic force it's not in the direction of magnetic field it's not in the direction of velocity but it's in the direction that's perpendicular to both the magnetic field and the velocity and really the only way to describe this is in three dimensions and that's what right hand rule is designed to teach you in three dimensions given two vectors, a uh, magnetic field vector and velocity vector, what's the direction of the third vector, the direction of the force vector. I'll, I will go into this more in the right-hand rule video, but uh, for those of you who remember a lot from your geometry class, what this basically comes down to is that the two vectors, magnetic field and velocity, they define a plane. That's the plane that's illustrated here, the plane that the hand is in. And the force is in the direction perpendicular to the plane. Okay, more on that later. I'm highlighting this now just to give you a little bit of a heads up that magnetism, while very familiar in some aspects, is also new and can be strange. So section 11.5 gives us a more concrete example that's easier to think through. So imagine a strong horseshoe-like magnet, which uh, you can use to set up a magnetic field going this way from left to right on this page. And if you have a current that's flowing through a wire like this, imagine a circuit with a battery, then current is flowing through the wire in this direction. Roughly, they will be close to coming out of page. Then what the right hand rule says is, again, more on this in a separate video later, is that the force on this current carrying wire is perpendicular to both the magnetic field and the current. And in this particular case, the force points up. And if you do this in an experiment, you can actually see the wire jumping up. So the rest of the section describes the connection between this and what was being described in section 11.4, so please give it a read through. Um, I will point out what the importance of all this uh, very uh, complicated, complex material is. This is the basis of motors, electric motors. So if you want to understand how something like an electric car works, how an electric motor works. What you cover in sections 11.4 and 5 basically describes the fundamental working principle of a motor. So you have some outside device that sets up a magnetic field. This can be done by permanent magnet or it can be done with electromagnet. And you send the current through a loop of wire and that causes force 
on this loop of wire, which causes torque. Then go back to chapter 7, and that torque is what rotates the electric motor. So all these are somewhat abstract sounding and frankly strange laws are very important in explaining a lot of modern technology. And section 11.7 was what I was referring to earlier about the direction of the magnetic fields produced by electric current. So this section goes into more detail, so please take a look. Um, you saw that straight wire above, this is the loop of wire, and how the overall shape of the magnetic field is related to what was discussed above. And really when you want to generate a magnetic field in a practical way, solenoid is how we do it. And you can think of solenoids as being built up out of many loops of current. So all of this describes the one side of the connection between electricity and magnetism. Basically saying electricity can cause magnetism. You have a battery and a current flowing in a wire and you can use that to create magnetic field without any permanent magnet or anything. So the next section is describing the other side of this connection. You can cause electricity with magnetism. That's what induced the voltage is describing. So this setup describes the experiment which illustrated how magnetism can cause electricity. And I think I'm going to make a separate demonstration video to show you how this works. But, um, well, this is what the pictures are illustrating. Imagine a coil of wire with no battery or nothing connected here. This is a meter that's measuring how much um, current is flowing through the thing or how much voltage is being induced. Depends on the exact setup. And as you move a magnet around this coil, you will see this needle move around. If the magnet is standing still, then nothing will happen. This needle will be just in the middle. But if you move the magnet towards it, needle goes one way. And when you move the magnet the other way, the needle goes the other way, and so on. This is the basic illustration of what we call Faraday's law that describes the induced voltage. And please read through the rest of the section. I just want you to point out this apparatus here and highlight how similar this looks to the motor that you just saw in section 11.6. That's because this is a motor. It's just being run backward. So in a motor, you provide electric power and that creates mechanical rotation, mechanical work. You can take that exact same device and provide mechanical work and that'll produce electricity. This is how electricity in your home is generated. At the power plant, the steam engines there provide the mechanical power to an apparatus that looks like this, and as it turns, it uh, produces electric current, then it's transformed, described here, sent to, to the residential households, then down transformed, and then distributed through the power grid. It's an, uh, to me, it's an amazing piece of modern infrastructure. So the rest of chapter sections wrap up the remainder of these chapter sections on Faraday's Law and related technologies. Please take a look at it. Lenz's Law is a fairly important aspect of Faraday's Law that enforces conservation of energy. Uh, I think you have an essay question on something that relates to this um, relating through eddy current. There's a video that illustrates eddy current and how that's tied to Lenz's Law. And the transformers not the Hasbro kind, but the electrical transformers. And the alternative current, these are uh, ubiquitous pieces of uh, technology in and around your home. So the transformer, uh, the down transformers near your house provides the 110 volt that comes into power plugs in your home. And the reason your home uses alternating current is really because of the fundamental physical basis of how transformers work. So as common as they are, describing how they work 
that um, needs all the physics material that you covered in this chapter. That's why only now we are covering these transformers. So please take a look. If you understand the working of transformers, then um, you can tell yourself how, that you have a fairly good grasp of how Faraday's law works. And finally, this uh, section 11.11 .11 is on. Well, this is the source of the historical debate between Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla on whether the power grid should be DC-based or AC-based. And what we know from history is that uh, Tesla won and we use AC for power distribution. And this is mainly because of the efficiency of using high voltage to distribute power, but the safety of using lower voltage for actual in-home usage. So uh, please take a read through and uh, send me any questions as usual. So as I said, this is a long chapter and uh, I wish we had more time to spend on it, but um, do your best with the amount of time you have. And um, as usual, above all, please make sure you can work through the homework assignment. If you can do the homework questions, then, um, then you're doing fine. So until next time, bye.